Hello and Happy New Year. Happy 2021. Hopefully this year will be better than the last year. So in this video I want to bring in the new year by helping people understand what has been known for thousands of years or since the first legal system was created. And that is that all legal things are fictions. What is real? Things that seem real can be complete fictions. This video presentation is concerning the legal system as fiction. It has long been known that most things people believe to be real are not real. They are fictions. The writers of fiction who are trained lawyers, attorneys, and judges have a superpower when it comes to writing legal papers or making legal arguments that sound factual when they are actually complete fictions. There is a definite line between authentic and inauthentic when it comes to man and his fictions. I have read a few books and some papers on this, and as I move through these philosophies, it becomes more and more apparent that most of what is written on paper, even, even what seems factual, are actually fictions. The idea that quote-unquote legal things, such as legal names, the one on your birth certificate, legal corporations which live into perpetuity, legal statutes, legal money, legal ideas, or abstracts, legal trusts, are all in fact fictions. For one, a legal name is not the name of an actual human being. This is a lawful name, a Christian name, a given name, a family name, etc., but not a legal name. A corporation which lives into perpetuity as well as legal trust can never die. Things that never die can never actually live. Things that do not live have no life and therefore are fictions. They are theater. Legal money is not real money, as we know. Only gold and silver can be real money. Abstracts, of course, are not real. In this video, I hope to explain well enough that anyone can understand that legal fictions, including legal persons, are fictions. This has been known for a very long time. In fact, almost since the inception of the legal system. In Justinian's Code, Justinian wrote of a way for man to be in harmony with nature. He wrote how people should live a certain way so that they do not, so that they do not inbreed, how certain members of families cannot intermarry, how a slave must be given the chance to be freed, or as it was called, manumitted, how a baby is not automatically born into slavery, and other common sense things so that man could remain in harmony with nature. However, many of the laws today, including the founding documents, are simply selling abstract ideas, legal fictions. I do declare, if the law declares something, does the law declaring it make it a truth? If the law declares something to be true, is it in fact true? If the law declares that a thing being recorded makes it into a notification, can you be considered to have been notified about something simply because it is recorded? Can the law make something real simply because it is recorded? What if records are hidden in some obscure place? What if the law states that something must be recorded and recording the thing is notification, but the word re record or recorded or recording is not defined within the law? then quote unquote recorded could be thrown in the trash. So the statutes can state a thing must be recorded and recording it is notification. Would mean in layman's terms, a thing thrown in the trash is notification. How can you be notified if it was thrown in the trash? I guess that would depend on what quote unquote notification means. In 1912, Morris Cohen said this, Consider how much would consider how much would our controversy over the nature of truth have been enriched if instead of our easy dictumous divisions of proportions or propositions into the true and false 
We have taken notice that lawyers call of what lawyers call legal fictions. Such propositions occur, for instance, when we say that the Constitution is the will of the people, or that judges simply declare and never make the law. Or when we say the innocent purchaser of a chattel subject to mortgage has had notice of this fact, if only the mortgage is duly recorded. These propositions, like the statement of the actor, I am thy father's spirit, are not adequately, adequately characterized when we say merely that they are true or that they are false. End quote. Therefore, many things can be claimed, written, declared, etc., but doing so does not make it so, does not make it actual, factual, and real. We must use common sense. Concept or reality, theory or fact, illusions or truth. Judicial opinions are based on a variety of fictions. The language in the law is often fiction without people realizing it. So we have a legal system that is written as fictions, fictions being metaphors. The various departments interpret the fictions. The court write opinions, which are fictions based on an interpretation, which is a fiction based on a legal writing, legislation, which is also a fiction. So we end up with a fiction of a fiction of a fiction at the very least. Lon Fuller in his book, Legal fictions says, quote, fictions are to be found not only in the opinions of judges, but in the critical treatises written by men free from any of the influences that supposedly restrain the judge and warp his expression, end quote. In the book Constitutional Law as Fiction, author LaRue writes, quote, the authors of judicial opinions intend to persuade the reader that the result reached is right. These opinions contain fictions. The use of fiction is essential for persuasion, end quote. Therefore, we have opinions written by judges that are meant to persuade that a department or agency interpretation of a legal fiction is true and correct. Colleges and universities promote the confusion of the fiction from reality. Here we have a picture of Harvard Law School. LaRue wrote in his book called Constitutional Law as Fiction that he graduated from Harvard. In his book, he says that when he started practicing law, he realized that what he learned at Harvard was wrong. That's because colleges and universities promote the teaching of all sorts of fictions as if they were truths. Most importantly, they teach fictions as if they were factual. We live in a fictional world. All the world is a stage. The ancient definition of person is mask. Law without fiction has it not been found possible to dispense of law, of fiction in law? There is no way to have a legal system without fiction. When the Articles of Confederation were written, many of the states did not send representatives to the Confederate Congress because there was no force within the Articles of Confederation to force men to show up. When the 16-year-old boy did not show up to fight in the Revolutionary War, it was because there was no force within the law. As a free, sovereign, and independent people, there was no such thing as quote-unquote conscription or quote-unquote draft. Conscription and draft goes against freedom. The Constitution was written by the representatives who did show up for Congress to force the others who didn't want to show up. This is why the Constitution was written. It conveyed, it conveyed and allowed the president to order 
members of the military of the United States and allowed him to appoint officers of the pres as the president of the United States of America, the executive officer of the states. The Federation and its legal system allows men use the idea of a draft or conscription, which does not actually exist in a free society, to compel men to show up for war. Without the emotions, the fear, the anger, the idea of power, men will not act unless it benefits him. The same is true for a legal system. It is used to compel men not to speed on the highways, not to steal from one another, to pay taxes, and compels religious men to show up to church and pay their tithes. Fictions are a type of sales pitch to which men have an emotional response and act accordingly. Looking at the fictions, examples we see in fictions. The function of speech is to influence the soul. However, have you ever known someone completely insane, someone with such screwed up morals to be influenceable? Do you think anyone could have said anything or written anything to Jeffrey Dahmer to make him feel compelled to stop killing and eating other people? Probably not. Therefore, if the legal system is to compel men already good, it does nothing because good men do not need a legal system. If the legal system is to compel bad men to do good and bad men are not compelled by the legal system, the system does no good. Therefore, the legal system does no good. It only gives some men a pretended authority or a fictional or metaphorical authority to do things that end up injuring real men and women. Rhetoric, the story of persuasive speech and writing. Rhetoric, the ability in each case to see all of the available means of persuasion by Aristotle. Law is persuasion known since Aristotle. Aristotle has written much on rhetoric and law. Socrates makes an analogous argument in Plato's Phaedras. Plato has Socrates tell Phaedra that it does no good to say that a speech should, be, should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, or that a speech should be sublime or common in its diction or rapid or deliberate in its delivery. All such generalizations are of no value unless one knows when and how to use them, which in turn requires one to know the conditions of the human soul and how and why the soul can be moved. Therefore, the function of speech is to influence the soul. Legal systems are speech, and speech is to influence the soul. Court opinions are speech, and court opinions are to influence the soul. The opinion of a court is therefore a sales pitch to get others to accept it as fact when it is all just rhetoric, or that is fictions, and later we will see metaphorical. Constitutional Law as Fiction, Court Opinions, by LaRue. In his book, he states, The proud towers of the law are built not on the level bedrock of fact, but on the perplexed terrain of fiction. That judicial opinions are filled with stories that purport to be factual, but that instead are fictional, and furthermore, that these fictions could not be eliminated without crippling the legal enterprise. So in other words, the en legal enterprise is nothing without your belief in it and your um, movement of your soul. Statute authorizing a fiction. Mr. Justice Black delivered the opinion of the court. A New Jersey statute authorizes how can a writing 
written to persuade, call a statute, quote-unquote, authorize anything. Often, while raising children, the children would conspire to get into trouble together. With fathers being at work most of the time, a mother might have to put on airs as if she were mean to get them not to kill each other. She might have had often behaved as if she were very angry over a small issue in order to keep them from committing a worse act. This would work most of the time. Parents, Some parents use emotions as a means to control their children, such as, if you don't clean your room, your father will be very angry when he gets home. The government is no different. Statutes themselves are just words on paper, backed by a force called police, sheriff, or military. But what the statutes themselves are is pure fiction. The acts committed upon someone who has disobeyed the fiction is real. Pain is not a fiction. Death is not a fiction. Prison is not a fiction, etc. However, the legal system is. And that means that the so-called authority by the statutes given to the police, the sheriff, and the military are also fictions. We have fictions, if not followed, are followed by real pain, real court fees, real embarrassment, real prison time, etc. Custom as a source of law, common sense. Some crimes need not be written. All I have said so far is not to say that some things are not crimes or should not be crimes or should not be unpunished. Murder is a crime. Theft is a criminal act. Gossip that ruins someone's life or livelihood is criminal. Writing them down is, a, is good, and these types of things can be written down or they can be unwritten. Common sense ideas, things of good reason that most people agree upon, need not be reduced to writing. And that's a quote that I've read in a lot of um, legal writings. Reduced to writing. They are common to us all, and we all accept them. However, we can choose to write them, and the writing should be a guideline where the community can easily make adjustments. Law is twofold, natural and written. The natural law is on the heart, the written law on tables. All men are under the natural law. St. Ambrose. Natural law. Natural law need not be written. Natural law is unwritten because most of us have the ability to understand right from wrong. This is common sense, good reason, and logic abilities. Some people, however, lack this to a major extent. They have, not, <clears throat> they have enough to get themselves through life, but not much more than that. There are probably levels of common sense, good reason, and the capability of using logic, and so some people are just better at it than others. We have seen people in our communities become hysterical over small things, especially in the recent months, in the last couple years. We have seen that there are a great many people who lack the ability to use common sense and good reason. They are illogical and driven by emotions, which oftentimes their emotions contradict and they are easily persuaded. They quickly go mad in herds, but they also go mad individually, which may be a modern day phenomenon. Illusion, fiction, writing, court opinions. Court opinions do not usually look like fictions. The authors of court opinions do not believe they are writing fiction and their readers do not normally imagine that they are reading fiction. Instead of describing their work as writing fiction, most judges would say that deciding cases is their primary responsibility. People bring their disputes to court, and if they are unable to negotiate settlements, they submit their disputes to a judge. Example, in Everson, quote, this is alleged to be a use of a state power to support church schools contrary to the prohibition of the First Amendment, which the 14th Amendment made applicable to the states, end quote. The word alleged tells us the opinion is based on a fiction. Contrary to the prohibition of the First Amendment, is it really contrary to the First Amendment? Who decided the case was contrary to the First Amendment? Did the 14th Amendment really do anything at all? 
Just because the 14th Amendment made an issue applicable to the states does not mean that it can be forced upon the states. If it is clear that a person does not want the 14th Amendment forced upon them, why must they accept that it is applicable to them? Therefore, we have another quote. Without persuasion, law would not be law, and without fiction, there would be no persuasion. Rhetoric as an art of persuasion by an old lawyer written in 1880. And this is a book. These are not quotes from the book. Without persuasion, law could not be law, and without fiction, there would be no persuasion. Legal discourse are made of stories that are fictional. The function of speech is to influence the soul. The word rhetoric goes back to a Greek word which means to speak and is derived from the same root as the words verb, irony, and word. Rhetoric became the study of persuasive speech. The authors of judicial opinions intend to persuade. Judicial opinions contain fictions and that these fictions make the opinions persuasive since rhetoric is a study of persuasive speech and writing. Judicial opinions contain fictions that are absolutely essential to the business of judging. Fiction is the story of something that didn't really happen. Judges and writers on legal topics frequently make states they know to be false. These statements are called fictions. These are all quotes from various books that I've read on the topic. White lies are still lies. Fictions are fictions. The purpose of fictions is to deceive. From Legal Fictions by Lon Fuller, quote, For a fiction is distinguishable from a lie by the fact that it is not intended to deceive. This point, I think, in this, in this quote that I'm giving you here is that the law is not intended to deceive you because they assume that it's well known that all the laws are fictions. Okay, I think that's what he's trying to say here. It may be objected that as to that large class of fictions, which we call historical fictions, is general, this generalization does not hold. Maine's classical definition of the historical fiction as, quote, any assumption which conceals or affects to conceal, the fact that a rule of law has undergone alteration, its letter remaining unchanged, and changed is operation being modified, end quote, seems to leave room for the intent to deceive. The English courts were in the habit of pretending that a shadow, which might in fact have been taken from the plaintiff by force, have been found by the defendant. So taken by force, yet they claim to have found it. Why? in order to allow an action which otherwise would not have lain. If this fiction does not deceive, what is its purpose? So the, the fictions are intended to deceive. And, and in a video prior to this one, I had talked about how, and I gave sources for this um, process that takes place in, in the legislative um, lawmaking process, which is to write law with the intention to deceive and to leave it vague and, and words undefined so that the departments and agencies could interpret the intention of the law. And then the courts side with the interpretation, which means that someone who goes into court can never win because then they interpret it their own way. And there's a disagreement and the courts decide, the courts side with the departments and agencies' interpretations. So fictions are intended to deceive. Deception is a form of lie. A lie is a lie. There is no white lie. It is deception nonetheless. Deception needs persuasion. Persuasion is rhetoric. A rhetoric is speech or writing. Speech and writing are to influence the soul. Influencing the soul requires emotion. Emotion causes action or inaction. Therefore, laws are fictions. Fictions are lies. Lies are meant to deceive. Deception is influence. Influence is rhetoric. Rhetoric is speech writing or speech or writing. The law and court opinions are in writing. Laws and opinions are fictions.
The language we use influences the way we think. Fiction is a linguistic phenomenon. What do words mean? Words may be originally intended to mean one thing, but as people perceive their meanings, they come to mean something else. For example, in the book Legal Fictions by Lon Fuller, he writes, Thus, in The Men Were Sifting Meal, we have a literal use of sift. In Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, sift is a live metaphor. In the sifting of evidence, the metaphor is so familiar that it is about equal chances whether sifting or examination will be used and that a sieve is not present to the thought, unless indeed someone conjures it up by saying all the evidence must first be sifted with acid test or with the microscope. So fictions in language can be quite difficult at times to recognize. So the point of me writing this about the quote in the book on sifting, um, you have to read it a few times to really understand it. And what they're saying is that when they write things in the law, the judges, lawyers, and attorneys, and the, the um, politicians, the people in Congress, they write them to deceive. They write them intentionally to deceive you. So fictions in language can be quite difficult at times to recognize. They, they write them in a way that when you read it, you don't really understand what it's saying. But let us look at the word quote unquote individual, which could mean only the individual specifically, a class of individuals named in the code. Perhaps there is no individual named in the code to which then we have to ask who the code applies to. Perhaps it does not apply, apply to any individual since no individual is named. Perhaps it applies to the individuals who wish it to apply to them. The people who have been moved by the code or the statute or the law. Perhaps the code says individuals who choose to marry. Does this mean all individuals who choose to marry? Who does the code apply to? Does the code state who it is applicable to? What if the code applies to anyone who chooses to get the state involved in their marriage and both individuals have to agree? Could it also be possible that the, close of the code applies to two individual corporations who are doing business with the federal government who choose to merge, which is a marriage? Let us look at the word thing. It has been said that the word thing was never a word until the legal system made it one. Let's look at another example. In the action of driver, the defendant is alleged to have found a shadow he may really have taken by force. In actions arising under, quote, attractive nuisance doctrine, end quote, the defendant is alleged to have invited children to visit his premises. These statements are felt as fictions. Is this because there is, an, because there is any inherent reason why the words used could not acquire a special sense in which would make them true? Could not finding mean a tech, in a technical sense taking? Could not inviting be extended to include attracting? Neither of these things is impossible, but the fact simply is that these possible changes in meaning have not occurred since they have not, the statement remains fictions. Lincoln, the wordsmith, state of words. Assent to purchase of lands for forts. Uh, section 103. This is in chapter 389, July 30th, 1947, 61 stat 644, section 103. The section is titled, Assent to Purchase of Lands for Forts. It reads, the President of the United States. The President of the United States, for example, here is the Commander in Chief. The President of the United States of America is the Executive Officer. It says that in the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Article 2, Section 2. So as the Commander-in-Chief, he's authorized to procure to the assent of the legislator of any state 
within which any purchase of land has been made for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings without such consent having been obtained. So the assent without consent. The first sentence starts with the President of the United States. The President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief in of the Land and Naval Forges, uh, Forces, which is shown in the Constitution of Article 2, Section 2. The President of the United States of America is the executive officer, meaning he is the second in command over the states. The words in this section mean that the President is procuring the purchase of lands for building forts, military posts, reservations, uh, military reservations. There is no right to purchase lands for federal use where, they're, where they do not build forts. All the lands that the Federal Reserve Banks and federal buildings are on are unconstitutional. They have no constitutional power. They have no authority. Therefore, there is no right to legislate for any per place but forts since the Congress only has power over the United States, which is in Article 1, Section 1, and Article 1, Section 8. If the president was ever in command of the states, he would not be the second in command of the states, meaning the United States of America, as the executive officer stated in Article 1, or Article 2, Section 1. If the United States was a country, they would not need to have consent from the legislators of the states to purchase lands for forts. The United States is not a country, it is an agency paid by the states and a sort of social economic system to build forts for the nation called the United States of America. If the Congress of the United States was in full power over the entire country called the United States of America, why would they require the president to procure the assent of the legislator of the states in which is the land they want to purchase for building forts. So why would they need permission to build forts on land that they already own? Why does the preamble use both the phrases the United States and the United States of America? And why does it have a list of things the United States is supposed to do for the United States of America? Is this because the quote, the United States, end quote, works for the United States of America, meaning the United States is an employee of the states collectively? How did all this change from the states being in control of the federal government to the federal government being in control of the states and taxing all its private citizens, the very class of people they were instituted to protect? Is it because Lincoln was very good at twisting words and ideas? He was a debt collecting lawyer for the railroads for a long time before the railroads helped him get into the position of president. Lincoln twisted the meaning of the idea of what a state was and the position of the federal government to the state and the state to the federal government. The railroads who basically controlled the federal government at this point was able to pass the 14th Amendment through Congress, which had its start in 1866 and was passed, which pretends that every person in America is a citizen of the United States. It pretends that. It's a fiction. But as we have seen, the United States are the federal lands to which the federal government purchased for building forts and procured to the assent of the legislator of the states to have complete jurisdiction, meaning power and authority, over to make laws for. Therefore, the Congress makes laws for the military posts, which are collectively called the United States as a military force, is charged or trusted with the protection of the private citizens and the private property. Basically, the one job they were charged with doing, and they failed. However, the 14th Amendment did not make state citizens federal citizens. It only made federal citizens state citizens also. However, the original Constitution was specifically anti-state citizenship of federal citizenship, which uh, were the federal, where the federal Constitution states that representatives and citizens are, or senators are not to be also inhabitants of the state, meaning they are a federal citizen called a citizen of the federal lands, the lands being the United States, and therefore the representative have been seven years a citizen of the United States and not an inhabitant of the state wherein he was elected. Therefore, a military person would understand this best. Its meaning is, in fact, that a person who is elected as a representative must have served as an officer of the military on a post for at least seven years and cannot have had his service time 
disrupted by returning to live as a private citizen of the state, being an inhabitant of the state. This is the same type of idea and wording when a military person leaves service to apply for his GI military GI bill for college where he must have left service to become a citizen of the state in order to receive his benefits of college. So the Constitution is basically saying to be a representative of Congress, he has to serve his time as a military officer of the United States on federal lands without interruption of service, not being a citizen of the state, or at least not having left service before going to Congress. If you do not agree with this, just ask a military person if they can use their veterans, veterans benefits or college benefits while being still a federal citizen. Furthermore, the federal government cannot force a state to accept citizenship of any federal person, and the original portion of the Constitution specifically states the opposite of the 14th Amendment. There are many parts of the Constitution that people don't understand because they simply will not read it. If someone were to actually read it and make an effort to understand it, they would know that it is a government of very little power and authority. It's mostly all fiction. We must, not, we must not only take a deeper look at what the Constitution's words are, but what they mean and the relationship to each other. I've made a number of videos on this topic. We're almost done. Warrant. That an act is warranted. Warrant appears in modern times to mean that a person may use force to do a thing. This does not seem to be what it was intended in the 1700s and 1800s. Where a warrant was to do many things, allow a person to make a withdrawal from a bank and true money such as gold and silver using a warrant from the Treasury Department to give an agency permission to ask a person to enter, to request a person's appearance in a matter, but not to be used as force, to request someone aid in war efforts, etc. However, over the time, the idea of words lose their original meaning and take on a new meaning, for example... In the modern Bible, Romans 14 states that people should obey their government. In a Bible written in 1598, the Roman, in Romans 14, it says to the effect that people should not seek revenge on others. Instead, pay their minister some gold, and he can exact revenge on another for you. And therefore, your conscience will remain clean, and you can still go to heaven. Another example of this, federal agents are not supposed to go off federal lands. Instead, they would issue a warrant to... Warrant and the warrant would be sent to the sheriff or law authority in the state and the law authority would search for the runaway person, sometimes a military officer going AWOL or any military service member or civil servant who has committed a crime on the federal lands and left the federal lands to, to seek to hide out in the states. Today, the word warrant seems to carry the context that the federal government or the state can use force to take property, kill, injure, destroy, etc. Someone and their children and their property. So I also made a video on this, um, and it has to do with figurative language and literal language, and such as the word stepmother and the ideas we assign to the word stepmother. A lot of people use stepmother meaning someone evil, someone bad, because, I mean, look at Cinderella's stepmother. But a stepmother um, is not necessarily a bad person. So authentic. Real is authentic. Salesmanship is propaganda. What is real? Alexander Hamilton and Federalist Number 10 writes, quote, an unequivocal experience, end quote. Whose experience was it? Why was it unequivocal? That appears to be a measurement of abstract term. Quote, that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example, end quote. It seems to have been. So not that it absolutely was, but that in his perception, which is his own reality, it seems to have been something that it very well may not have been. But their conduct and example... Who is seeing the conduct and by what authority do they conclude that they can decide what their conduct means? In other words, my actions may be one thing to me, but something completely different to someone else who is only guessing what my conduct means. Hamilton proposes a question and gives only two choices. As we well know, choices come from the person who is choosing. There are often perceived 
they're often perceived by a person, many options, and different options by another person, and so on. For every person as a solution to a solitary problem. Many people will say when given the choice between a Republican and a Democrat, they will choose a side over the other side, but few will say that they will write in a candidate, abstain from voting, or realize that they are not actually part of the system at all and that it matters not who wins. Hamilton poses this, quote, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever dis destined to depend on their political constitutions on a court accident and force, end quote. Therefore, Hamilton proposes a choice between two things, what he readily has an answer. Of course, it is the answer that he wants to, which, which he wants, to which he will argue for. This is a type of writing we see throughout all the various writings of all the time, uh, their propaganda sells pitches, they cause feelings of insecurity, and need to act quickly, etc. They move the soul. In another paper by one of the founders, he clearly states that he has taken every pre precaution he has imagined. How nice that he restricts precautions to his own imagination, and instead of actually letting people decide for themselves or taking proper steps. Even if he had taken an all legal and lawful steps to accomplish a thing, why use such language? I imagine that I have done everything possible. Instead of listing the things historically required, things that make reasonable sense and common sense, and list what he has actually done, why leave it to his imagination? This is because his imagination is an abstract. An abstract thought is metaphorical. Metaphors are meant to conceive, to con convince or deceive. Written law is abstract thought. Abstract thought is metaphorical. Abst abstracts are metaphorical. Legal metaphors are mostly dead. <clears throat> Live and dead fictions. I've tried to make this um, portion as simple as I possibly can. If you have a difficult time understanding it, I've included links um, in the description so that you can pick up some of these books. They're all online and read through them. In the book Legal Fictions by Lon Fuller, we look at the idea of metaphors. He starts by describing that fictions are living or dead. He describes it as such. A fiction is created. The fiction is created at a certain era or time. At that time or during that era, the fiction is accepted as truth or reality. But over time, the fiction is no longer a reality or truth for the people living, so the fiction dies. In the time of the Roaring Twenties, there was a fiction commonly accepted. That fiction was that it was common to view young girls in what some might call suggestive poses as beauty of innocence. Today we call it child pornography. The old fiction of it being beautiful was at one time truth or reality. Today it is dead. Abstract thought, which is fiction or metaphor, dies over time. Things once commonly accepted as reality are no longer accepted in its original form. And so the thing, the idea, the abstract thought dies and becomes a fiction or metaphor. Eliminated the fiction, uh, eliminating the fiction from law often means only substituting dead metaphors for live ones. So ending a fiction only allows for a live metaphor to replace the dead one. So replacing something that we don't accept with something that we do accept, even though both of them are still fictions or metaphors. For example, in the consensual contracts, there is said to be a requirement of a, quote, real meeting of the minds of the parties, end quote. However, quote, meeting, end quote, becomes a fiction because the original meaning dies and becomes replaced. Fictions die when there is change in practice. As people more and more often accept contracts without a meeting of the mind, the word meeting loses its meaning and becomes a fiction, a metaphor. The live metaphor has become a dead one. So in reality, a true physical meeting of two people who agree on something dies, and now it's become something where you just sign a piece of paper. The distinction between live and dead metaphors shift. 
Sometimes dead metaphors are rejected and become live, and sometimes live metaphors are rejected and become dead. The law therefore shifts. However, moving the fiction does not remove the metaphor. It only makes it either live or dead. The author of the book Legal Fictions continues later in the book to say, the tendency that I may call the desire to keep the form of law persuasive. Metaphor is the traditional device of persuasion. Elimination of metaphor from the law or eliminate metaphor from the law and you have reduced its power to conceive and convert because it no longer moves you. It doesn't mean anything to you. So they just change the wordings to wording that you now will accept. Understand law is fiction. <clears throat> I hope that I've been able to convey this information to you in a way that you can le that you can easily understand. In summary, legal things are fictions, fictions are metaphors, metaphors persuade. Persuasion is rhetoric, rhetoric moves the soul. The soul creates movement. It creates energy. It gets you to do stuff. Movement in a specific direction is theater. Theater is fiction. Fictions are in the legal system. Legal fictions are born and live. They then die and are reborn through time. Fictions die. Fictions are metaphors. Fic metaphors die. Fictions live. Fictions are metaphors. Metaphors live. Fictions and metaphors make up the legal system. The legal system is theater. Here are my um, links, and I'm going to put these in the um, description.